for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Paws. Welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. My name is Darren Gibson. I'm your co-host. And I'm Katie Steele. And Jack Prince is off this week. His daughter Allie is getting married this weekend. So congratulations to her and her man. Um, So Jack, hopefully we'll be back next week. In the meantime, we've got a lot of topics to cover. we got to talk about the new government in Israel We have an update on a story from last week. We also have to talk about members of the British Parliament asking Joe Biden to drop the extradition papers for Julian Assange. So we'll get to that in a little bit. We also have hammer time this week, and we have several off-the-cuff stories. So we've got a lot to cover today. Just a reminder that you can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash Southpaws Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter at Southpaws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at southpawsradioshow.tumblr.com. You can follow us on YouTube by doing a search for Southpaws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Southpaws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime you like at Spreaker.com or at Stitcher.com by doing a search for South Paws. You can find us on Apple Podcasts by searching for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and YouTube accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern. And you can listen to us on Great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, KZGM in Kabul, Missouri, WOOL in Bellows Falls, Vermont, and KEPJ San Antonio, Texas. So thank you for airing our show. And for those of you that have a local Pacifica station in your area, I ask that you please donate your time and or your money to them because they can always use the help. All right, let's go right into an update from the show. Last week, I had mentioned a story about a Houston hospital that had suspended nearly 200 employees because they refused to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, we have an update to the story. This is David Heath writing for USA Today. This is June 13th is when it was written. In the first federal ruling on vaccine mandates, a Houston judge has dismissed a lawsuit by hospital employees who declined the COVID-19 shot, a decision that could have a ripple effect across the nation. The case involved Houston Methodist, which was the first hospital system in the country to require that all its employees get vaccinated. U.S. District Judge Lynn N. Hughes ruled Saturday that federal law does not prevent employers from issuing that mandate. After months of warnings, Houston Methodist had put more than 170 of its 26,000 employees on unpaid suspension Monday. They were told they would be fired if they were not vaccinated by June 21st. The hospital had made it clear it meant what it said. It fired the director of corporate risk, Bob Nevins, and another manager in April when they did not meet the earlier deadline for bosses. In recent weeks, a few other major hospitals have followed Houston Methodist's lead, including the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Louisville, New York Presbyterian, and several major hospitals in the Washington, D.C. area. Houston Methodist CEO Mark Boom predicts more hospitals soon will enact vaccine mandates. Many hospitals and employers were waiting for legal clarification before acting. After the ruling, Boom said, quote, We can now put this behind us and continue our focus on unparalleled safety, quality, service, and innovation. Our employees and physicians made their decisions for our patients who are always at the center of everything we do, end of quote. The lawsuit was filed by 117 workers led by Jennifer Bridges, a nurse at Houston Methodist Baytown Hospital, who declined the vaccine because she considers it experimental and dangerous. The judge disagreed, writing, quote, 
This claim is false, and it is also irrelevant, end of quote. Learning of the dismissal from USA Today, Bridges vowed not to give up. She has initiated a change.org petition that, as of Saturday, had drawn more than 9,000 signatures and a GoFundMe to pay for the lawsuit that has raised $130,000. So she sounds like she's the Marlena Pavlos Hackney of the hospital world. <laughs> see, I see it different, though. I don't. I agree with the lawsuit. I don't think that um, anybody's job should be able to force them to vaccinate well, or to take any kind of of drug unfortunately the courts disagree with that and i, I and i That's mentioned it on, and i and i mentioned it on last week's show the massachusetts ruling in 1905 that you can mandate vaccines the greater good of the public health supersedes your individual rights what if it's not the greater good of the public health because look at who owns everything mm-hmm. are they do we trust them because they're going to own all the vaccine companies they're going to own all the healthcare industry I don't trust them. I mean, I understand that vaccines have worked in the past and that we needed them. Mm -hmm. Do I trust that that's going to continue to be the case? No, I don't think the people that have the money and the power are going to invest in real science. I think they're going to invest in whatever is going to make them a profit at the expense of humanity. Mm -hmm. Which they are doing that now. Exactly, which is why it scares me that, you know, instead of ruling on the side of individual freedoms... We are consistently ruling on the side of corporations. Well, in this case, uh, I will say they're ruling on public health versus individual freedoms. So uh, here's what uh, Bridges said. Quote, this doesn't surprise me. Methodist is a very large company and they're pretty well protected in a lot of areas. We knew this was going to be a huge fight. We are prepared to fight it. End of quote. The lawsuit claimed the federal law prohibits employees from being required to get vaccinated without full U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval of the vaccines. The FDA has authorized the Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines under a special provision for emergencies. The judge dismissed that argument as well, saying that law does not apply to private employers. He also dismissed an argument that anyone who gets the vaccine is effectively a human subject in an experimental trial. The judge wrote, quote, the hospital's employees are not participants in a human trial. They are licensed doctors, nurses, medical technicians, and staff members. The hospital is not applied to test the COVID-19 vaccines on its employees, end of quote. The lawsuit was filed in Texas State Court but was moved to federal court at Houston Methodist's request. The federal judge ruled Saturday that Texas state law protects workers from being fired only if they are forced to commit a crime. So, <laughs> wow. See, my fear is that we, you know who owns our medical care system. You know who owns our hospitals. You know who owns the pharmaceutical companies. It's the DeVos family. Yeah, and while well, the DeVos is in others. Mm-hmm. And others well, yeah, that are just like them. Just like them, exactly. And so what it comes down to is when they're in control of handing out those licenses, those medical licenses, do I trust the science that's coming from those people they decided to give them to? No. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, since you mentioned the DeVosses, we might as well mention this story real quickly. On Thursday, an announcement was made that Spectrum Health, which is basically the DeVos-owned hospital Mm -hmm. in Grand Rapids, is looking to merge with Beaumont Health in Dearborn, Michigan, to create what would be the largest employer in Michigan. It would be larger than General Motors. Which is scary. And it's in health care, which is terrifying because we've already seen in Grand Rapids and West Michigan, Spectrum Health is very closely tied to all of the hospitals here. Oh, yeah. If not already merged with completely through Trinity Healthcare. But St. Mary's and Metro, I believe, are part of Trinity Healthcare with Spectrum, right? Is that no, uh, St. Mary's? Metro, no, Metro is part of University of Michigan. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. right. You're right. They're uh, natural and health. And St. Mary's is part of Mercy Health, which is... Thank you. That's what I was looking the, for, Mercy re- Health. The religious-based uh, yep. Okay, so yeah, it's <laughs> Mercy Health here that is connected to Trinity Health. Which is actually something I have problems with. I don't want religion tied into exactly. my health care i don't either but i don't want law enforcement tied into my health care either mm-hmm. and that's what happens when you get to devos owning hospitals and then merging and owning the entire system priority health is the insurance company that's connected to their hospital and i would imagine that if they merge that will be connected to beaumont as well mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So so basically, the judge in Texas, the federal judge, pretty much has said that Jacobson versus Massachusetts is still the law of the land in this country, <laughs> which that was the 1905 case that upheld that state governments can force vaccines on you for, again, the greater good of public health versus your individual rights. And that to me, I just think, I think it would be very possible, just as possible for the state government to say, okay, you can't participate in anything unless you get it without forcing it on somebody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, couldn't you just as easily block somebody from participating in any of the other things well, without forcing them to actually? Well, get... you happen to mention that a lot of the cruise companies, mm -hmm. you, you, will not, you will not get on the boat if you cannot prove that you're vaccinated. Right. A lot of concert venues are starting to do this. Now, if you that I can comprehend, and that's fine. If you're a private company yeah. that's offering a business and you get to choose who you're going to give it to, okay. But when you're getting into the realm of public services and public and just public enforcement of something to where mm -hmm. it's a, a blanket law or a general law, I don't know what the vaccines are going to be later. I don't know who's going to be in control of those. So having a Supreme yeah. Court decision that says. Yeah. And by and by the way, the Massachusetts case had to do with the smallpox vaccine and smallpox was eradicated from the planet in 1978 or nine. Mm -hmm. So vaccines work. Period. End of story. They work. They can work. That doesn't mean every vaccine <laughs> works. You know what I mean? Or that it isn't not every vaccine is more is safer than it is dangerous uh, if they're not. As I stated last week, the only place you can find the smallpox disease is in a lab now because it's wiped out. Right. We. I'm not saying that we haven't wiped out diseases and that vaccines yeah. haven't worked. I'm just saying yeah. that doesn't mean every vaccine ever is going to work. Yeah. The same way, which you know? is which is why you're supposed to have clinical trials and. But we've already all that. seen from the last administration how easy it is to take a sociopath <laughs> and put him at the top of an agency like the FDA, right? We've We're still seen seeing this. that with the post office, exactly, for, and that's why I'm God so sakes. concerned. We cannot rely on science or agencies, knowing that those are all just as flimsy as the next president. Yeah, that is the big issue. It's not the science; it's. The people in control, yeah, because, which is a separate issue. Well, science can be manipulated by money. Anything can be manipulated by money. Well, that's <laughs> that's been proved in the past, too. How many times have the cigarette manufacturers right. yep. introduced studies, oh, smoking doesn't cause cancer. And oh, then, no, it'll save your life. But then, but then you get the internal <laughs> memos where the science is pure junk, and they know that it's junk, and they're exactly. paying for it. They're paying for the results they want. Same with the oil industry. We're watching it with our water. We're watching it with the fluoride. We're watching it with PFAS. You know what I yeah. mean? Every single agency. I'm looking at the, from the county health department up to the EGLE, up to the federal EPA. Like, it, it is in every single agency. So mm -hmm. do I want them to say, okay, if, if we give you this vaccine, you have to take it? Heck no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's go on to our next topic here. I know you want to talk about what's happening in Israel. And <sighs> it is just, well, I, once I heard that this coalition was going to happen, I'm like, this isn't going to end well. Well, sure enough, guess who won the pony? Uh, right here. <laughs> you know, the most startling thing about this for me was how little fanfare it got. Yeah. How little people even know well, yeah, happened. because nobody the, knows because the media right is sucking up to netanyahu oh yeah as well as uh, the entire police department and unions across the united states oh also so it's everywhere closely connected to israel so yeah if that doesn't send chills down your spine then you have you're not paying attention like yeah let me give you the story here this is jotam kofino and Deidre Shesgreen, writing for USA Today, and this is dated June 13th. And again, this happened over the weekend, so... Yeah, they Friday night news dump. Yeah, or, <laughs> well, weekend news dump. Yeah. Because everybody's out enjoying themselves on Saturday and Sunday, hopefully. Israel's parliament approved a new government on Sunday, ending the record 12-year tenure of Benjamin Netanyahu as prime minister and swearing in a fragile, diverse coalition that has promised to break the country's political gridlock. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that because yeah. in the next sentence here, 
The change came by the slimmest of margins, 60 votes in favor, 59 opposed in Israel's 120-member Knesset. One member abstained. So this is very fragile. This is not going to end the gridlock. It's probably going to make it a lot worse. It's definitely made it a lot worse for the Palestinians who live in Israel because the ceasefire is over and they got bombed earlier this week. Well, it's made it worse for Joe Biden, who is not saying anything mm-hmm. about any of the violence that's being perpetrated against the Palestinian people right now. And he's going to have to answer for that yep. sooner than later. How do you say anything, anything about the right when this is what you're doing? Yep. Far-right politician Naftali Bennett, who once worked for Netanyahu, becomes Israel's new prime minister for two years in a coalition agreement that includes eight separate parties and is led by Bennett and centrist Yair Lapid. Lapid will serve as foreign minister and become prime minister after Bennett's two-year stint. Ihan Goldenberg, director of the Middle East Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, a Washington-based think tank, said, quote, it really is the end of an era, end of quote. The remarkable vote came amid heightened tensions, daily protests, and threats of violence against those seeking Netanyahu's ouster. On Sunday, the incoming prime minister was heckled throughout his opening speech, prompting security to remove several far-right and ultra-Orthodox lawmakers aligned with Netanyahu from the plenum hall. In his speech, Bennett focused mostly on domestic issues such as repairing Israel's economy. He said, quote, We will forge forward on that which we agree, and there is much we agree on, transport, education, and so on, and what separates us we will leave to the side, end of quote. He also promised a new page in relations with Israel's Arab sector. Yeah, that new page is getting rid of the ceasefire and Uh, bombing. I think that the new page, to be honest, is the Belt Road Initiative. I think Netanyahu is gone because they wanted somebody who was on board with BRI. When they talk about transport, that's exactly what they're referring to. When they're getting quotes from the Middle Eastern Security Agency, that's exactly who is helping to engineer it. My next plan is going to be to pay attention to what's going on with Israel, China, and the BRI. Mm -hmm. Israel's Arab citizens make up about 20% of the population but have suffered from discrimination, poverty, and lack of opportunities. You might as well say theft, too. Yeah, and it will get worse because if they do jump on board with Belt Road Initiative, that is going to immediately direct more discrimination and more violence towards the Muslim people. Mm Mm-hmm. Netanyahu has often tried to portray Arab politicians as terrorist sympathizers, though he also courted the same Arab party in a failed effort to remain in power after March 23 elections. Bennett highlighted one possible flashpoint with the United States, embracing the same hard line Netanyahu took against the Iran nuclear agreement, which the Biden administration is trying to revive. Bennett said its renewal would be a mistake. He said, quote, Israel will not allow Iran to arm itself with nuclear weapons. Israel will not be a party to the agreement and will continue to preserve full freedom of action, end of quote. But Bennett has also promised to take a less partisan approach to relations with the U.S. after years in which Netanyahu aligned himself closely with Republicans in Washington, and more specifically, Donald Trump. Bennett said, quote, My government will make an effort to deepen and nurture relations with our friends in both parties, bipartisan. If there are disputes, we will manage them with fundamental trust and mutual respect. End of quote. Joe Biden, who has known Netanyahu for decades, said he welcomed the new government and looked forward to working with Bennett. The two men spoke by phone after Sunday's results. In a readout of the call, the White House said, quote, The leaders agreed that they and their teams would consult closely on all matters related to regional security, including Iran. The president also conveyed that his administration intends to work closely with the Israeli government on efforts to advance peace, security, and prosperity for Israelis and Palestinians. End of quote. Oh, really? This is very interesting because Biden's handlers have been grooming this relationship with him and Netanyahu since he was young. Mm -hmm. decades yeah for him to be gone now yeah that tells me that they are setting up to there's not going to be a great relationship Mm -hmm. between israel and the united states and as soon as we are an enemy of israel we are an enemy of everybody that yeah that's not good (laughs) oh we're we're gonna 
uh, how is it he phrased it? We're going to work closely to advance peace, security, and prosperity for Palestinians. Oh, uh, oh, r- really, really? <laughs> yeah, that's my thoughts on that. No, you couldn't care less about the I, Palestinians. But, but to be fair, politically, should they take those moves? Right. Mm -hmm. That is going to put them in a different place in world politics and the perspective of the rest of the world, global leaders. Mm -hmm. It would make us look bad and them look good, which is exactly what I expect uh, other leaders to be trying to organize. Yeah. Sunday's vote regulates Netanyahu, Israel's longest serving prime minister, who is sometimes known as King Bibi, to an opposition figure and increases his legal jeopardy as he battles corruption charges in an ongoing criminal trial. Yep. Does this sound familiar to you? He has labeled the charges a witch hunt (laughs) and tried to use the prime minister's office to win legal immunity from the Knesset. (laughs) God, that sounds like Donald Trump. Yep. But Two peas in a pod. I wouldn't be surprised if there are bigger powers that are... He didn't see it coming because he was playing in the game, right? And nobody ever involved on the bad team thinks the bad team will come for them. (laughs) Never would it happen, right? Because they're on my side. I'm good until it's my turn. Yeah. And and by the way, Trump's going to get reinstalled in August. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Reinstalling Trump. I can't even laugh about it anymore because they came so close on the 6th. To what they were telling us was going to happen, you know? (laughs) Oh, boy. In his speech to Parliament, Netanyahu vowed to remain the leader of his conservative Likud party and work to derail the new coalition government, which would force a new election and possibly return him to power. He said, quote, if it is destined for us to be in the opposition, we will do it with our back straight until we topple this dangerous government and return to lead the country in our way. End of quote. He added that he would, quote, continue the great mission of my life, ensuring the security of Israel. <laughs> Talk of about quote. a lose-lose situation. Mm-hmm. It's ego. That's all it Power is. Power breeds ego. And mm-hmm. yeah, and, 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 and the reverse. It's a, it's a catch-22. Yep, it is. The coalition is an odd bedfellows alliance that includes right-wing factions, center-left parties, and for the first time in Israeli politics, an Arab party. So that'll be interesting. We'll see how long it lasts because I don't hold out any hope, especially with Netanyahu. Yeah, this is very concerning. So mm. I, I already told you what my guesses are, which that's instinct, not based on a ton of education or knowledge. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, since we're talking about Israel, we kind of have to go into our next segment. But before we do that, we have to play the appropriate music. Stop! Hammer time! Oh, yeah, it's hammer time. It's time to drop the hammer on the douchebag of the week. And we've got three of them for you this week. They are Representatives Michael Waltz, Republican of Florida, Representative Jim Banks, Republican of Indiana, and Representative Claudia Tenney, Republican of New York. Why? We have this story. This is Ivana Sarek writing for Axios.com. Three House Republicans introduced a resolution Monday to condemn and censure members of the squad over comments on Israel, accusing the progressive cohort of, quote, defending foreign terrorist organizations, end of quote, and, quote, inciting anti-Semitic attacks, end of quote, across the U.S. It comes a week after Representative Ilhan Omar, Democrat of Minnesota, tweeted about, quote, unthinkable atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban, end of quote, in reference to potential investigations by the International Criminal Court. A group of 12 Jewish House Democrats issued a statement asking Omar to clarify her comments, which we mentioned on last week's show as well. Omar specified that she was not making a moral comparison between the U.S. and Hamas or the Taliban. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat of California, and her Democratic leadership team welcomed Omar's clarification in a statement. In a press release Monday, the three representatives, Waltz, Banks, and Tenney, singled out Omar and Representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Democrat of New York, 
Ayanna Presley, Democrat of Massachusetts, and Rashida Tlaib, Democrat of Michigan, saying the four women, quote, continually lie to the world in attempting to equate Israel's right to defend itself with the attacks coming from Hamas, end of quote. Well, let's just stop right there. I don't see Hamas luring Israeli children out with candy and then shooting them in the back. Israel has done that, and it's verifiable. So there you go. And to be honest, America has massacred people in the same way. <laughs> and for whatever reason, if you have yep. an Air Force on your team, it's okay. You're good. Mm-hmm. It's legal. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, you're a murderer and get life in prison. So if you're going to come at these women and say that they are advocating terrorism, you have to go for anybody who's claimed patriotism in the United States. Yeah. In an accompanying fact sheet, they criticized the squad's opposition to U.S. weapons sales to Israel. So right there's, the, right there's the big issue. They want to see the money from the arms sales. These are the same people that want to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia and then get mad at these women for supporting terrorism. Yeah. And I've told everybody on this show how I feel about the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. Go back yeah. in the archives. You know, it's, this, it's, it's insane to me that the Democrats have gotten away with this for so many years. I don't understand it. It's nuts. It's cutting our own throat. Because that's what's going to happen. Because you know they'll turn one day. Well, and this, it'll happen. I guarantee you, these Dems on this list that are that want these, you know, comments clarified, have supported it. <laughs> In the press release, Walt said, "Quote: We cannot turn a blind eye to members of Congress openly defending terrorist attacks by Hamas against our close <laughs> ally Israel, nor their dangerous rhetoric, which has contributed to anti-Semitic attacks across the country." End of quote. We only defend our own terrorist attacks. <laughs> yeah, apparently he forgot that Omar <laughs> criticized Hamas too. <laughs> Jesus. Banks added, quote, actions speak louder than squishy words. Speaker Pelosi can let members vote on our resolution or she can cover for the Hamas caucus and their anti-Israel and anti-American rhetoric, end of quote. Yeah, yeah, Banks, you're representing the KKK caucus, in my opinion. Drone bombs are louder than words, too, and y'all don't have anything to say about those. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The drone bombs is both the Republicans and the Democrats are supporting all that. So Right, and then coming out and condemning terrorism. Help yeah. me out here. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, boy. So to Representatives Michael Waltz, Jim Banks, and Claudia Tenney, congratulations on winning the award. We have this message for you. Don't be a douchebag. That's right. All three of you need to stop being... Douchebags. Yeah, keep 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 kissing Israeli ass. Keep supporting it, folks. Just keep it up. And as a matter of fact, I've <laughs> the honorable mention was going to be the twenty one Republicans who voted against awarding medals to the cops who defended the Capitol. So we'll just leave that one alone. Oh boy. By the way, did you happen to see one of the uh, Capitol officers called out a Republican member of Congress who refused to shake his hand. I did not. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to look that one up here because I forget which member of Congress it was. It, there, there's so many of them that say they're pro-police, but then when it comes down to it, are lying their asses off. It's hard to keep track of They're them. pro-police union, Darren. Yeah, there you go. And and by the way, police unions are not actual true unions like the building trades or any of the no, hospitality industry employees. They're violent unions. gangs. That's what police unions are. They're the most violent gangs in America. Mm-hmm. There you go. Hey, that's that's a good way to phrase it. Well, it looks like I have found which member of Congress it was. <laughs> Uh, Representative Andrew Clyde, Republican of Georgia, apparently refused to shake the hand of D.C. Metropolitan Police Officer Michael Fanoni on Wednesday after Fanoni introduced himself as someone who responded to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. This is, according to Forbes magazine, this is Andrew Solander writing for Forbes. Apparently, this was witnessed by two House members, one Democrat and one Republican. So there's apparently witnesses to this. (laughs) 
Oh, oh, even better. The witnesses are Eric Swalwell, Democrat of California, and Adam Kinzinger, Republican of Illinois. <laughs> Kinzinger is a, uh, not a big fan of Trump at all. Uh. <laughs> oh, I love it. This is beautiful. Fanoni told the Washington Post the interaction occurred in an elevator. He claimed that Clyde completely froze and stared at him and that when asked if Clyde would shake his hand, he responded, quote, I don't know who you are, end of quote. I like that answer. <laughs> I would have said a cab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good Lord. Uh, like I said, the, the hypocrisy among abound. the far right is just astounding. The, the hypocrisy on the left is astounding in and of yeah, itself. Honestly, but then yeah, the far right the is just... The hypocrisy is astounding. Then, <laughs> then, the, then the far right is 100 times worse. So there you go. Speaking of, <laughs> this is kind of a surprise and a very pleasant one. This is Alan Jones writing for PA Media out of Europe. This is dated June 11th. A group of British MPs have written to the U.S. president urging him to drop his administration's attempt to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. So MPs, for those of you in the colonies, are members of parliament. <laughs> They're not military police. <laughs> Good point. In an open letter to Joe Biden, who was in the U.K. for the G7 summit, they said that dropping the prosecution would be, quote, a clarion call for freedom, end of quote. Assange is being detained in Belmarsh Prison in London while the U.S. continues an attempt to extradite him over the activities of WikiLeaks. The MP said they had hoped Biden's victory might be the occasion to draw a line under the prosecution. Well, that, I knew that wasn't going to happen because it was Obama that was looking to extradite him. Right. Right. And it's, I mean, they have stopped it the whole time. They've refused to allow the U.S. to extradite him yet. And they're still begging. But I mean, this is not the first letter. There were there were 160 current and former world leaders, lawmakers and diplomats mm -hmm. who endorsed a call for the U.K. to free him and stop his extradition back in September. Yeah. So this is it's been all over the world. People have been calling for it since he was arrested. And yeah. so far, nothing. Yeah. <sighs> They added this, quote, unfortunately, the U.S. Department of Justice is still pursuing this case, leaving Julian Assange facing a third year of incarceration in Belmarsh High Security Prison. The effect of your predecessor's decision to take a criminal case against a member of the press working in our country is to restrict the scope of permissible press activities here and set a precedent that others will no doubt exploit. The case against Mr. Assange weakens the right to publish important information that the government finds uncomfortable. Indeed, this value is central to a free and open society. The case against Mr. Assange also undermines public confidence in our legal systems. Our countries are also increasingly confronted with the contradiction of advocating for press freedom abroad while holding Mr. Assange for years in the UK's most notorious prison at the request of the US government. We appeal to you to drop this prosecution, an act that would be a clarion call for freedom that would echo around the globe. End of quote. I'm seeing the same thing here I saw in our last story, which is the United States coming off as a narcissistic, unempathetic, inhumane country that doesn't care about people at all. Which, which we are. It, absolutely. <laughs> but when that becomes your reputation to the rest of the world as a whole... Yeah. We know what happens, right? They direct their drone bombs at you. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's going to take for us to understand that we need to stand up for ourselves and we need to stand up for humanity because if the world just keeps watching us sit down and destroy it all and letting it all go, we're going to reap the rewards from that. Exactly. The letter was signed by 24 MPs, including former labor leader Jeremy Corbyn, labor MPs Diane Abbott and John McDonnell, and Green MP Caroline Lucas. So everybody's on one side and we're on the other in the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, that's true. That's very true. I tell you, well, we need to get to our next story here. This is Chris Mills Rodrigo writing for The Hill. This is dated June 15th. 
Researchers at the intelligence firm Logically said Tuesday that they have identified an influential figure in the QAnon conspiracy community who pushed dangerous narratives about coronavirus and child trafficking. In a new report, researchers linked the Twitter handle Cue the Wake Up to Jeremy J.J. Sakati, a documentary filmmaker. The account amassed over 140,000 followers on Twitter before being banned during one of the platform sweeps of QAnon-related accounts last year. Sakati denied taking part in the account when reached for comment biologically. The Hill was unable to reach Sakati. Q the Wake Up played an influential role in spreading the false theory that Wayfair.com was selling trafficked children along with expensive furniture and was identified among a key cluster of accounts pushing the pandemic conspiracy that coronavirus is a creation of governments aiming to complete authoritarian takeovers. Let me just tell you, they don't need a virus to complete an authoritarian takeover because they almost have it right now. But to be fair, in the past, <laughs> they generally use it generally comes after a virus. If you, if you look at the authoritarian takeover. Well, you had mentioned before we, we started it. recording Christopher Columbus. Yep. He was passing out the blankets with the smallpox. Right. Mm -hmm. Look at the Spanish flu. What followed the Spanish flu? The Red Scare. Mm -hmm. If you look at all of the major viruses, it's when the major government crackdowns have followed. And so, yeah. again, I'm always over here on the side of the devil's advocate going, I don't know. It's a little sketchy to me. I'm questioning all of it. <laughs> yeah, But Wayfair.com selling traffic children. No, but I'm, <laughs> as I've said, <laughs> are they selling traffic children? Probably not. That seems a little far-fetched. But generally where there's a far-fetched conspiracy theory, there's something mm. that the government is trying to cover up, right? Uh, wayf <laughs> wayf Wayfair selling children. <laughs> Bullshit. Total oh. fabrication. Okay, but what are we bringing in from? Uh, <laughs> what are we bringing in from China right now in Taiwan? Because if you look at all the shortages, mm. you know it's you, you need to start questioning the logistics system and what's really happening there. And I think the Wayfair thing was almost an excuse to call anybody crazy who starts questioning transportation, which is, in my opinion, something we should be looking at really carefully with all the infrastructure going in. Mm -hmm. Accounts associated with Q the Wake Up also developed significant followings on Instagram and YouTube before being removed over the last year. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I got to bring this up because Jimmy Dore also yeah. was removed from Facebook yesterday, I heard. I have not heard that. Yes, his page was canceled, as they're calling it. They're saying he was canceled. What are our thoughts on We've talked about cancel culture a lot, and I, I knew that as soon as it started happening on the right, it would be happening on the left, right? Because that's how everything works. And I think Jimmy Dore is crazy left, which is why I would assume they're going for him first, because the left isn't even arguing about it. They're going, oh, he's crazy. You got to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. This is the First Amendment, though. We're talking about free speech when social media is such a big platform and a way of communicating right now. So I just I see the slippery slope. We've talked about it, and I think we're on it. Yeah, I have not seen that. My concern is, like, what if, if someday they decided Southpaws mm -hmm. was talking about things they didn't want us to talk about, <laughs> then what? And you've already talked about leaving Facebook because they obviously have way too much control. Yeah. I have advocated that Facebook needs to be a publicly controlled utility, just like electric, just like gas, just like the telephone. In which case, all of our civil rights would apply to our Facebook pages. Mm-hmm. You know, the funny thing is I am a member of Jimmy Dore fans on Facebook, and they don't have anything about it. Really? Yeah. But the funny thing is I cannot find Jimmy Dore's Facebook page. Uh, my friends have been talking about it. I didn't see articles or anything. It was just actual discussion from my Facebook friends. So Otherwise, I'd cite where I saw it's, it. It's a poss <laughs> you know, it's also a possibility that maybe Jimmy decided screw Facebook. Could that be a possibility, too? I don't too? think so because of the amount of discussion there is out there that I've seen just from my friends talking mm -hmm. about him being taken down. Um, uh, let me see here. And at um, that point, there had been hours of the conversation, so I don't think it was. Well, the Jimmy Dore uh, show page is on Facebook. I just pulled it up. Really? I wonder if it's a personal page. And Oh, actually, I heard it was a copyright violation issue is what they were saying. But it was like an episode of TYT that he shared. 
which is why people were like, he got canceled if they're taking it down for sharing an episode of TYT. Well, let me ask you this. Was he critiquing it? I'm not sure. Don't have that info. Because if he is, that's under fair use. He can use it. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And it seems like I, I've just never seen anybody be taken down or violated for copyright. His personal Facebook is up too. Okay. So maybe it's back then. Yeah. I don't know. There I don't was think... much discussion this morning over canceling Jimmy Dore, which Jimmy Dore is, like I said, so far radical right now and so kind of at odds with the mainstream left, I would say, that uh, it would not surprise me that he would be one of the first ones that was disabled. Yeah. No, I have. Uh, I'm not seeing this. I'm so able must to. Be I'm, a, I'm able to access everything. Okay. I will tell you exactly who was talking about it. And when. Okay. Let me go ahead and continue here. A Q the Wake Up channel that uses similar branding to the former Twitter account is active on the messaging service Telegram, but has less than 1,500 subscribers. Researchers at Logically said they hope that unmasking Q the Wake Up will reduce the account's influence and dissuade it from boosting dangerous theories. Lead investigator Nick Bakovic told The Hill that in cases where accounts evade deplatforming or rebrand, there's, quote, Value in taking away that anonymity, especially when it's being weaponized to push harmful information. In some cases, anonymity means they straight up can lie about their identity. In other cases, because they are shielded from accountability, it allows them to post stuff that is more daring, more extremist, and that makes the harmful content more dangerous. End of quote. Researchers said they initially were investigating the Twitter account because of inconsistencies in the type of content it was posting, but quickly found links to prominent QAnon figure Jordan Sather, who sent in posts that the person running Q the Wake Up was a male friend who helped him film Above Majestic, a 2018 documentary with heavy conspiracy themes. Logically found that the account's handle was JJ from Jupiter when it was created in 2009, which researchers said appears to be a reference to Sakati's band at the time. Sakati is a graduate of the Berkeley College of Music. Researchers said that analyzing interactions with the account ultimately led them to Sakati. They were able to verify that the Twitter account was registered to a phone number and email belonging to Sakati. Sakati told Logically that Sather had used his information for the account. Sather said he made the account but declined to explain the earlier activity on it when contacted by Logically. He had said in a video on his Rumble channel this year that he would be starting a podcast soon with a friend who ran Q the Wake Up. The Hill reached out to Sather for further comment. The report comes as many segments of the conspiracy community have moved away from QAnon branding. The shadowy figure known as Q, who alleged that Donald Trump was working to expose a global network of Democratic elites and media figures trafficking children, has not posted on the image boards they crafted the theory on for several months. While some of the most clearly QAnon elements have faded, the broader anti-institutionalist and anti-democracy movement born out of the theory appears to be growing in strength and following. Previous unmaskings of QAnon influencers have led to changes, researchers say. After a logically investigation revealed the identity of the individual behind QMAP, a heavily trafficked site that compiled Q's posts, the website was taken down. Sakati most recently produced a film about hospice care called Death is But a Dream that was released earlier this year. So, uh, were you able to find anything? Uh, yeah, I did find a, the discussion was on one of my Facebook friends pages, and it was first posted... 23 hours ago, it said Facebook just canceled Jimmy Dore. I think he's nothing more than a clickbait producer. However, his Facebook page shouldn't have been canceled. Censorship mm. is going too far. That was posted on the page of Larry Douglas Snyder. And then everybody else came through and confirmed that it was disabled for copyright violations. Which, it, again, if he's critiquing something the TYT posted, that's considered fair use. It's protected. Yeah, but they were basically saying that he was taken down for... Violating the DMCA with what he was sampling. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but then people were arguing over whether Facebook should have the right to do that. And that's kind of where my question came in is, you the, know, do they? The Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Ah. That's what the DMCA is. 
Is that the new thing that they just... Uh, nope, 1998 is when okay. it was passed. So Bill Clinton. Oh, okay. Yeah. But again, if he is critiquing something, he has the right to use that material under fair use. Well, and it looks like it's back up. So I'm assuming that he argued with the decision and it was changed. But again, we're back to the point of is Facebook a court? Like, should they have the right to make those decisions and take people's accounts down? Exactly. And you've always said no. I think I would agree with no at this yeah. point. <laughs> exactly. Facebook, they, they all have too much power. Right. And even though I think I said in the beginning when they took Trump's account down, I didn't think it should be something the, the court should uphold. But at mm. that point, it needed to come down. Yeah. I wanted it down, even if the court didn't uphold it later. Well, it wasn't even the court. <laughs> it was uh, Facebook's own. That's um, who took it down. But yeah. that's what I said. I didn't think they should have the right. But I wanted his gone so bad in that moment, but, uh, I was cool with it. Let but, the courts um, fix it later. Yeah, but <laughs> un, but until Facebook is a public utility, as a private corporation, they have the right to do whatever yep. the hell they want to. Yeah, exactly. You know, speaking of, <laughs> I've got this story. Speaking of uh, cuckoos, as I like to call them, I have this. This is uh, CBS News reporting. Uh, th this article was written by the Associated Press on June 11th out of Salem, Oregon. Republican lawmakers voted with majority Democrats in the Oregon House of Representatives to take the historic step of expelling a Republican member who let violent far-right protesters into the state capitol on December 21st. Legislators said on the House floor that this could be the most important vote they ever cast. They then proceeded Thursday night to expel an unapologetic representative, Mike Neerman. Vote was 59 to 1, marking the first time that a member has been expelled by the Oregon House in its 160-year history. Pardon me for uh, asking the obvious here, Darren, but uh, why wasn't he in handcuffs? Why in the world did they have to vote to expel him why wasn't he serving a prison sentence well i'll get to that in just okay, a minute here <laughs> the only vote against the resolution was his own of course <laughs> representative paul holvey a democrat who chaired a committee that earlier thursday unanimously recommended nearman's expulsion reminded lawmakers of the events of December 21st, which were an eerie foreshadowing of the much more serious January 6th traitorous assault on the U.S. Capitol. I added traitorous. Oh, okay. I was like, what? That's what they are. They are traitors. True. Holvey said, quote, On the morning of December 21st, a couple hundred protesters, some of them heavily armed and wearing body armor, arrived at the Capitol for a protest with the intent to illegally enter and presumably occupy the building and interrupt the proceedings of the Oregon legislature. Staff and legislators were terrified. We can only speculate what would have happened if they were able to get all the way in. End of quote. Neerman said he let the protesters in because he believes the Capitol, which had been closed to the public to prevent against the spread of the coronavirus, should have been open. The assault happened during a peak of the pandemic. He said, quote, expelling me won't make this place safer, end of quote. He additionally told uh, CBS affiliate KOIN, quote, this has not been a fair process. The easy thing to do is expel me, end of quote. But even Republicans who are often bitterly opposed to Democratic initiatives on climate change and some other bills said the crowd outside the Capitol that day was not made up of constituents who wanted to peacefully engage in the democratic process. Some were carrying guns. Some shouted false QAnon conspiracy theories about Democrats kidnapping babies. <laughs> they carried American flags, banners for Donald Trump, and a sign calling for the arrest of Democratic Governor Kate Brown. They broke windows and assaulted journalists. Representative Daniel Bonham, a Republican and a member of Holvey's special committee, said, quote, nobody should have opened the door to the people who were here that day, end of quote. This is a Republican saying this. So that's how much this Nearman had hate going for him. I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I just, I laugh because it was the same with the Democrats and the second that they were in danger, mm, yeah. everything changes. <laughs> the final straw for Republican House members came on June 4th when video emerged showing Neerman choreographing how he would let protesters into the Capitol a few days before it actually happened. 
For his fellow lawmakers, that was proof it was a premeditated act, which Nierman acknowledged. All 22 of his fellow House Republicans wrote him on Monday, strongly recommending he resign. As lawmakers gathered to decide Nierman's fate, a few dozen people waving American flags and one carrying a sign saying, I am Mike Nierman, gathered outside the Capitol. One reportedly kicked a metal door, sending booms through a marble hallway of the building. After the vote, Oregon State Police troopers walked some of the lawmakers to their cars, according to KOIN. Nearman was seen on security video opening a door to protesters on December 21st as lawmakers met in emergency session to deal with economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic. Protesters barged into the building, got into shoving matches with police, and sprayed officers with bear spray. Nearman faces two misdemeanor criminal charges. He said that he will seek a trial by a jury. He's one of 11 people facing charges stemming from this incident, by the way. So, misdemeanor, I'd make it felony, and I'd drop the jail on him because he deserves it. I think it's interesting that um, he was so <laughs> willing to, like, I don't think he was hiding anything, and I think he was surprised that everybody turned on him, and my guess is that's because they probably supported him up until they were the ones at risk yeah so they were scared exactly and that's, the, that's the funny part to me it's always you know they're so hypocritical the second they feel like they could have been in danger everything's different you know go get them <laughs> oh sh they're coming they're for coming me. for me i said go get them, <laughs> them not go get not me, me. <laughs> yeah that's just exactly what it is too oh oh boy well let's go ahead and let's wrap things up i've got three off-the-cuff stories here that we just need something to kind of lighten the mood a little bit. This first one, unfortunately, is not going to lighten the mood whatsoever. This is John Hayworth writing for ABC News. This is dated June 12th. A customer at a McDonald's in Georgia has been arrested after allegedly spitting on one employee and shooting another during an argument at the drive through window. The incident occurred just after 9 o'clock on Thursday when 26-year-old Devante Watts of Stone Mountain, Georgia, pulled up to a McDonald's restaurant located off U.S. Highway 129 North, 55 miles northeast of Atlanta. He ordered some food. At some point, an argument between Watts and the employee receiving his order took place. The customer pulled up to the pickup window in his car and allegedly spat on the employee. According to police, the employee went outside to confront the customer. The argument continued. As the customer drove away, he fired one shot toward the employee, but hit a second employee who was trying to defuse the situation. The employee who was shot was taken to the hospital for non-life-threatening injuries. Watts fled the scene and was arrested about 24 hours later. He's now facing multiple charges, including aggravated battery, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. And then they sent two armed thugs to pick him up and bring him to jail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've talked about this oh. before. Why is it the McDonald's? drive through that everybody goes nuts at. To be honest, I would imagine it is because the McDonald's drive throughs are the ones where they don't take care of their employees, and then the employees are pissed all the time, uh. and they're crappy <laughs> to the customers who are already paying too much and waiting too long, and they can't afford to go anywhere else, and so you have the perfect storm. Mm. Poverty breeds violence. Yeah. Well, this next story, if you're eating, you're probably going to want to stop for a couple of minutes. This is Hillary Hansen writing for the Huffington Post dated June 12th. NBC has indefinitely paused production of its upcoming competition show, Ultimate Slip and Slide, reportedly after multiple people on set came down with diarrhea. <laughs> Maybe the show should be sponsored by Pepto-Bismol. Right? I don't know. I feel like... <laughs> Explosive <laughs> diarrhea can really only increase the amount of slip and sliding. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Things get real slick. That's, that's what I thought. <laughs> it's oh like double God. dare, but brown. Oh, not green. gross. <laughs> oh. Maybe. Maybe it's green. Oh, maybe. <laughs> the rap reported Thursday that up to 40 crew members fell violently ill, citing a person with knowledge of the production. That person said people were collapsing and, quote, being forced to run into porta potties, end of quote, 
due to what was described as awful explosive diarrhea. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh about this, but... Oh, oh T- my. TMZ also cited an anonymous source close to production as saying that multiple people were ill with gastrointestinal symptoms. Spokespeople for NBC did not immediately respond to a request for comment from the Huffington Post. However, People Magazine confirmed that a shutdown began on June 2nd and that at least one crew member tested positive for Giardia. It's a parasite that can cause diarrhea. Ugh. A spokesperson for Universal Television Alternative Studios, which is producing the show for NBC, told People Magazine it is in the process of determining the next steps in order to complete production. The show is being filmed in California's Simi Valley, and it's supposed to premiere August 8th. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah, maybe they should take some time. <laughs> and and lots of Pepto. Yeah. <laughs> and our last story comes from the Cape Cod Times. This is out of Provincetown. Listen to this. This is dated June 16th. A little before 8 a.m. Friday, a veteran lobster diver Michael Packard entered the water for his second dive of the day. His vessel, the J ja and J, was off Herring Cove Beach and surrounded by a fleet of boats catching striped bass. The water temperature was a balmy 60 degrees and the visibility was about 20 feet. Licensed commercial lobster divers literally pluck lobsters off the bottom of the water. The 56-year-old dove down Friday morning and then he got swallowed by a humpback whale. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. Well done. Which then spit him out. (laughs) Well, that was kind of him. (laughs) (laughs) Packard originally thought he was in a great white shark, but he couldn't (laughs) feel any teeth and he hadn't suffered any wounds. It quickly dawned on him that he'd been swallowed by a whale. He said, I was completely inside. It was completely black. I thought to myself, there's no way I'm getting out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. And all he could think about was his 12 and 15 year old sons. So the... Humpback whale surfaced and spit him out. I mean, imagine <laughs> he being survived. completely inside a whale. Yeah. He estimated he was in the whale for about 30 to 40 seconds before it surfaced. He said, I saw light, and he started throwing his head side to side, and the next thing I knew, I was outside in the water. <laughs> Holy wow. And apparently somebody who was on his boat saw this happen. Oh, my gosh. Could you imagine getting footage of that? Oh yeah, that would be. I'm visualizing it right now. It's that would definitely stuff. that would definitely be the one hundred thousand dollar winner on. Uh, oh, we're on, on America's on America's, uh... America's funniest home videos. Oh man. Oh my God, this is just an incredible story, and apparently this isn't the first time it's happened to people. Oh my. But apparently, humpback whales know what is. Oh, they're so person. smart. They are. Yeah. They're very intelligent. Yeah. By the way, just to fill everybody in, apparently this guy not only has survived being swallowed by a humpback whale, but 10 years earlier survived a small plane crash in Costa Rica. Oh, wow. (laughs) So That's the the end of your lives. You've used them all. (laughs) He needs to give me the lottery numbers for this weekend. Right. (laughs) We'll be back next week, folks. I'm Darren Gibson. I'm Katie Steele. For Jack Prince and Kristen Cook, please support independent media and the First Amendment. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.